Hi guys, it's Cynthia again, and welcome to episode two of Virtual Painting and Poetry. Today we'll be discussing Sarah Teasdale's poem, Moonlight, while painting a moonlight landscape. So for the supplies today, you just need some water, a towel, watercolor, a piece of watercolor paper, and I use two size brushes, a bigger round brush and a smaller round brush. So let's get started. I am first going into a blue and putting it down about the middle of the paper um, or a little bit above the middle and we're just going to lay this down in horizontal motions. Sarah Teasdale um, was born in 1884 and she died in 1933 and her poems were pretty famous in the early um, 20th century. She is most well known for her lyrical style um, which we can definitely see in Moonlight, which we'll be discussing later in the in the video. Um, but her poems also were romantic in nature. No shocker, I like them because I'm a big fan of um, like romance era poems. And she used uh, some classical forms, and they were simplistic and very clear. She won the Columbia University Poetry Society Prize and the Poetry Society of America Prize for Love Songs, a collection of poems published in 1917. So she was she was a very well-known poet um, in this time. She doesn't get discussed a whole lot now um, when we talk about 1920 literature. When we think of 1920 literature, we think of Fitzgerald, um, Hemingway, which those authors, they wrote mostly short stories and, and novels, and they belong to the Lost Generation, which was one of the two movements that emerged in 1920 art and literature. Teasdale shared similar characteristics and themes with the larger names of the movement, especially um, the resentment toward materialistic things and cynicism when it comes to um, life after the war. Teasdale wrote um, several poems expressing her anti-war views, um, including There Will Come Soft Rains, which is probably one of her most anti, like her most popular anti-war poem. And um, it's very, you can definitely tell that she is a lyrical poet. Um, it's very lyrical in nature. It has a lot of um, beautiful images throughout the, the poem. And she explores the concept of nature without humans. And arguing that men can go on killing men until no more and nature would continue on. Um, it was very controversial at the time. And um, a lot of scholars still reference it today and it aligns perfectly with the lost generation and how they felt after or how their feelings toward the first world war which some people might be more familiar with um ray bradbury's short story short science fiction story there will come soft rains which was inspired by her poem um so i think that's that's pretty cool now that we have our first blue layer down i'm going to go in and darken the water um, I'm going to take a little bit of black, a little bit of black, um, using black can be kind of scary, especially if you get too dark, then you're, you know, you have to, you have to fix it, but I'm mixing it a little bit with the blue and while the paint is still wet and I'm just going to add dimension to the water, I want the water to be darkest in the back. Um, if you can see the reference photo, photo, um, it's darker and it gets bluer as we come forward. Um, it's not as dark as I wanted it. The reference photo is the po or is the picture that I'm I'm painting right now. Um, so you're seeing the left side of the screen is the after, um, but I kind of stopped before I ruined the painting. I wanted. Um, I wanted the sky to be a little bit darker and I wanted the, the, the sea to be a little bit darker, but I think it turned out fine. Um, sometimes you have to learn when to quit because there's been many times where I've continued painting and ruined the picture because I didn't know when to stop. So I decided to make the executive decision to end it before I ruined it. And the colors always dry lighter than they go on wet on the paper. So it's hard to, it's hard to gauge. Um, how how dark you want to go because I, typically I end up going um, too light. I lay down layers and I think it's dark enough but then once it dries 
it's not dark enough, but it's still, I, there just needs to be contrast between the sky and the sea. So we just keep laying down and, um, you want to bring, you also want to bring some of the darker colors down just to add some variation in the colors in the blue there. Now I am taking, um, a more yellow shade and a deeper shade that deeper brown shade that I just dipped into I'm mixing those colors and making sure there's a it's very sheer um, we want the first layer to be very sheer and um, I am going to lay down that color to start making the moon and start laying down your yellow color about in the middle of the section um, it doesn't have to be perfect just make a little circle and then fill it in so to begin talking about Moonlight by Sarah Teasdale, it's a short poem and it's two stanzas and um, she wrote it and published it in 1919. The poem reads, It will not hurt me when I am old. A running tide where moonlight burned will not sting me like silver snakes. The years will make me sad and cold. It is a happy heart that breaks. The heart asks more than life can give. When that is learned, then all is learned. The waves break fold on jeweled fold, but beauty itself is fugitive. It will not hurt me when I am old. So this poem is definitely a little bit darker than William Wordsworth's poem that we discussed in the last video. Um, it has a little bit more of a cynical tone to it, but you can still see um, the vibrant images that we have in this poem and the lyrical style that Teasdale uses. She explores the concept that age gives perspective, and she emphasizes this by repeating the line, it will not hurt me when I am old. The poem begins with that line, and it also ends with that line. To jump back into the painting, I'm going in with that deep golden color that we use to darken up the yellow, and I am putting the craters into the moon. There's no um, right way to do this or right placement to put the craters. I'm concentrating most of the craters on the left side of the moon, it just it adds a curvature and it makes it look more circular in shape and more of a sphere rather than a flat surface. And this first layer of color is going to be a light wash because we, we want to deepen up the actual color of the moon later on. Um, so I'm just laying down a light layer of this darker color and it'll add dimension also. When we go back in to deepen up the layers, there'll be lighter craters that will make the deep, deeper craters pop out more and it, it makes it, it look more like a moon. Like I said in the last video that I did, a lot of painting is just going back over the layers and adding dimension and depth, which gives it a better look. It doesn't, it's more three-dimensional and not flat. So if we look again at the poem, we will see the first image, a running tide where moonlight burned will not sting me like silver snakes. So that is where the inspiration for this moonlight landscape came about. Um, I wanted to do something where there'll be reflection on water, like she talks about. Um, this is an ocean. It's not, I guess you could say it's a running tide. Um, and I tried to do something with snakes, but I figured a moon would be, bit, like, would be prettier. <laughs> and it's almost, besides the waves break fold on jeweled fold, in the second stanza, stanza, it's the only image that we see. The rest of the poem is more philosophical and less tangible images. So, the years will make me sad and cold. It is a happy heart that breaks. The heart asks more than life can give. So there isn't an actual image we can put with that statement or those lines, um, but you still get a sense, you still get a feeling of what it means and how it would feel. And it's very cynical in tone, um, which I said earlier, the poem is very cynical, but sometimes life can be unforgiving and it's better um, to let go of things. And that's what she is getting across in this poem, um, that what is learned, when that is learned, then all is learned. So when you learn to let things go, or when you learn that your heart will probably break sometimes, it's easier and life will move on. I guess some could argue that it's more of an uplifting poem with kind of a cynical tone, um, 
because you have this self-encouragement with it will not hurt me when I am old. Sometimes when you go through something really hard, you try to reassure yourself that um, this is just a time and you'll go through the time and then you'll turn, hopefully you'll be stronger and better because of it. So um, I like to see this poem as more uplifting, but some people might prefer, uh, you know, I wondered lonely as a cloud. Those are filled with happier images. You're, they're still talking about life in general, but the life lesson is more positive. This one, there's still a positive twist to it, but it's just told in a very, in a darker tone. Um, it's not as dark as, say, Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, but it's still, it edges on the side of, of darkness. You guys can probably see that I'm focusing, um, darkening up the edges of the water, and that's because I'm going to leave the middle that first base layer because I'm going to go back in and add the yellow and that will just help the yellow to look more yellow and more of a glow as opposed to mixing with the blue and making it green. Um, so yeah, just darken up the edges and light brushstrokes and horizontal brushstrokes too, which will help add um, to the coloration of the water. Earlier when I was discussing um, the characteristics of Teasdale's poetry, I said that her poems were simplistic and very clear in nature, and you can totally see that in Moonlight, um, but there's also an allure to the poem as well, much like the moon itself. Um, you know, the moon has always been a symbol of darkness and beauty and something very intriguing about it. There's more, there's more to the story, usually. Um, whenever you whenever people talk about like the moon and use it as a metaphor but it, there's something so magical about this poem because when you read it it's very lyrical and sometimes it can be a little hard to understand you might have to read it a couple more times but it's also straightforward in the message you instantly know that there is something that the that the speaker is struggling with it will not hurt me when i am old and you know that a running tide where moonlight burned will not sting me like silver snakes is something that they have been struggling with for a while. So instantly the reader is aware of the speaker's perspective and the view on their life, but there also is questions that are left unanswered. So, you know, what is it that is making them stay up late at night? Is it everyday life problems? Is it life in general? And the first stanza kind of opens up the general discussion of you know, life and perspective, but then the second stanza kind of emphasizes a little bit more. The heart asks more than life can give. When that is learned, then all is learned. So it's a little bit more in general. The pain's a little bit more generalized, and it's talking more about life lessons that are learned and will help you get through. But she also introduces beauty, and beauty itself is fugitive. So maybe they're talk she's talking more about um materialistic things and the superficiality of beauty which the idea that beauty is superficial and is fugitive it does not last aligns with a lot of what 1920 literature talked about when it came from poets and authors that were following the movements of the lost generation so in just two stanzas sarah teasdale explores so much and you know leaves but leaves so much unanswered and I think that's something that's really intriguing about poems, and that makes me want to read more of her poetry. I'm not completely familiar with her. Um, this is the first time that I have read any of her poems, but this makes me definitely want to explore and read more because I like her style and the images and the language that she uses. I went in and I darkened up the craters of the moon. I took um, a little bit of water on my brush and mixed it in with the yellow ochre just right in the palette. Um, I want the color to be pretty pigmented and I didn't and I wanted it to be smoothed out so I added a little water but I but I didn't want to shear it out any and I added it to the bigger craters of the moon. Now I'm just mixing in my yellow shades to find the perfect reflection color so we can go in and start adding the base layer of the reflections. And um, I added a little bit of orange to the mixture because the mustard, the yellow ochre was a little bit too of a mustard color and I wanted a bit more orangey gold in the water. 
the reflections are going to be um, more pigmented and more vibrant towards the bottom of the paper, um, which just adds more perspective and your field of depth and everything. But yeah, like I said, right now I'm just laying down that base layer of where I want the colors to be and I'll add a little bit more, um, I'll have, I'll be a little bit more thicker with my reflections towards the bottom, which is why we left, um, that base layer down and we didn't go back over it with, um, with the deeper blue color. My house has a bunch of noises tonight. I'm sure you probably heard squeaking noises from my dogs and my brother's in the other room. Um, so his voice carries. So I'm sorry about all the noises. Um, but, you know, it's what you get when you live with several people and animals. You have a lot of noises all the time. <laughs> this image is a little bit easier, I feel, um, to follow along with than the dan or daffodil that I painted in the last video. Um, it's less colors. You have blue and black. And we used a yellow ochre and more of a yellow color. You don't have to add the orange in there. It really didn't do much. Um, but so there's less colors and the shapes are less intricate than, than they were on the daffodil. So I hope this one's a little bit easier to follow along and um, maybe a little bit less intimidating. Um, I'm still a beginner, so <laughs> it's not going to look perfect. Um, but... It gives us something to do, which is always nice to have something to do. <laughs> I would love to hear if any of you guys are, are familiar with Sarah Teasdale's work and if you have a favorite poem of hers or a favorite poet of um, the early 1920s. I'd love to check them out. I need to read more. Uh, I'm slacked on my reading, but now that school's out for summer, I should have more time to read. Hopefully. I mean, you can always make time for a book. But sometimes I choose not to, to make time <laughs> and then make an excuse that I don't have time. But everybody has some time. So yeah, if you guys have any poem suggestions, I'd love to hear them. And um, I don't think I have much else to, to discuss with Moonlight. Um, I've touched all the bases that I want to talk about regarding the poem. Um, so I will guide you guys along with the rest of the painting and hopefully um, it's easy to follow along. So right now I am going into the second layer of our reflections. So we're just going to go back in with a deeper yellow color and we're going to place it where we first placed our other, um, our first layer of the reflection. down the second layer of the reflection I am mixing um, a blue color this is gonna be the sky um, I want it to be a different color than the ocean so I'm taking a different blue the blue for the water is a little bit more um, vibrant and the the color for the sky is gonna be a little bit of a dollar truer blue so it'll look um, it'll be a different shade than the than the ocean and I'm beginning in the corner because I want the corners to be the darkest. Um, and we're going to go in a circular motion, which will create uh, a glow off of the moon and make it look like light is coming from the moon outward. And that's why the shadows will be mainly on the outside edge. Because we want the lightest part to be surrounding the moon and it, it gives it like the glow effect. And um, so yeah, just add the dark layers 
around the edges and we're going to keep going back and forth between um, darkening up the reflections and darkening up the sky. The song that's actually playing is Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. So it fits the theme very well. We have Moonlight by Sarah Teasdale, this Moonlight Landscape, and Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. So it's a theme, I guess. <laughs> also, a fun fact, my name, Cynthia, is an epithet of the Greek goddess of the moon. So I guess I'm also part of the theme. <laughs> I'm talking about moons. We're listening to a song that's called Moon. And um, yeah, my name also means moon. So it's a triangle. Cool effect. Well, um, that was weird. So uh, what I'm doing right now is I am cleaning off my brush and I'm going to go back in to um, a light, light wash of yellow. Um, very light wash. You don't want to mix with the, the green or you don't want to mix the yellow and the blue to make the green color. Um, it'll be really muddy and not really what we want. So I'm just going in lightly um, with the yellow and the blue mixes, but it doesn't there's not enough pigment to make it green. So it just gives it more of a more of the glow effect that we want while still adding a little bit of color, a little bit of shine from the moon.
Well, I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video and learning about um, Sarah Teasdale and some of the poetry and literature in the 1920s. Um, I hope that this tutorial was easy to follow along, easy to understand. And um, yeah, this is always the fun part is ripping off the tape at the end. Um, you get to find out whether your, your painting looks great or if it looks terrible. But this time um, I didn't have any bleed through with the paper so that's always exciting um i will see you guys in the next video bye